Bonjour tout le monde. I'm going to present in English as my French is still in its infancy. Um, so uh, thank you for, uh, for the invitation to, uh, to come to the conference and it's a pleasure to be here with my esteemed panelists. Um, in this presentation, I'd like to uh, provide some background on, on the Public Health Agency of Canada's interest in the measurement and monitoring of health inequalities, um, provide a bit of a snapshot on some of the activities we have underway, and uh, focus specifically on our current initiative uh, to develop pan-Canadian baseline uh, reporting on health inequalities that we're undertaking in partnership with uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, or CAIHI, and uh, Statistics Canada. Um, speaking of acronyms, I'm going to refer to the agency, the Public Health Agency of Canada, sometimes as the agency and sometimes as FAC, because we pronounce our acronym with a, an F at the front, the PH is an F. Um, so FAC's work is guided by in international, federal, and domestic commitments uh, to address social, economic, and environmental uh, factors that address, uh, that affect health and well-being and uh, uh, drive health inequalities. And so I'm going to walk through um, some of these commitments uh, bit by bit to sort of demonstrate how we've got to this place where we're developing pan-Canadian reporting on inequalities. So on the international front, as, as several people have already mentioned over the last couple of days, the, the, the WHO Commission um, report on social determinants of health uh, was released in 2008. This was followed in 2011 by uh, the World Conference on Social Determinants in Brazil. The uh, Rio Political Declaration on the Social Determinants of Health was the key conference outcome um, and was ultimately endorsed by all member states, uh, including Canada, at the World Health Assembly in 2012. So there's a number of policy anchors um, internationally that we're depending on in this work. So to help address current gaps in measurement and monitoring systems, the agency is working to fortify the evidence base on, on factors and dynamics that produce uh, health inequalities and to build our capacity to measure and monitor these. Um, at the federal level, these international commitments are, are echoed. Um, across the federal government, sex and gender-based analysis is recognized as a key competency for all federal public servants and an important part of the policy decision-making process. So, in fact, all um, submissions to Cabinet and to Treasury Board, including legislative proposals, program authorizations, and funding requests are expected to have undergone a sex and gender-based analysis. Um, to address implications on those as part of our due diligence in developing policy and programs. So Status of Women Canada, which is a federal government agency, promotes the use of a tool they call Gender-Based Analysis Plus, or GBA Plus, to assess the potential impact of policies and programs on um, diverse groups of men and women and boys and girls. Now, Additionally, a layer underneath that, within the health portfolio, which includes Health Canada, the Public Health Agency, the Canadian Institutes for Health Information, uh, the Canadian Food Inspec Inspections Agency, and a few others um, within the federal uh, family, have, place, have in place a common health portfolio, uh, sex and gender-based analysis uh, policy, um, so that we're applying this, again, through our, our research policy and program activities. And an important uh, thing to emphasize here, because these, uh, this is going to foreshadow some of how we're approaching our pan-Canadian uh, reporting, is that this policy recognizes the interplay of multiple categories of disadvantage and advantage, start, uh, stating in part that sex and gender-based analysis is meant to attend to the ways in which determinants of health, such as ethnicity, socioeconomic status, disability, sexual orientation, migration status, age, and demo uh, geography interact to, uh, with sex and gender to contribute to exposures to various risk factors, uh, disease courses, and outcomes. So that notion of, of multiple determinants coming together, interacting to produce uh, inequalities is very important. And at the agency level, addressing health inequalities has always been a core for focus of our work uh, since the agency was um, 
was instituted, and as one example, our Chief Public Health Officer chose the issue of health inequalities as the theme for his inaugural 2008 report on the state of public health in Canada. These are annual reports that, that come out, and, so, and subsequent years have focused on uh, key determinants of health, such as uh, early child development, healthy aging, and, of course, sex and gender. Within the context of these international and domestic and uh, institutional commitments to uh, mainstreaming health equity considerations, the agency has identified some priority areas to guide our efforts in advancing health equity. Um, the first priority is building agency capacity internally by embedding and integrating health equity considerations into all of our work through GBA+, um, as well as other tools like health equity impact assessment. Our second priority is engaging and leveraging stakeholders within and beyond the health sector um, to acknowledge that there are multiple sectors engaged in producing these uh, uh, social determinants of health and to develop strategic partnerships so that we can have coordinated action to address um, some of these fundamental factors. And then finally, using and, and strengthening the evidence base from routine surveillance functions to population health reporting to policy and program analysis. So I'll focus here on, on strengthening the evidence base, as that's the most relevant to our current discussion. Um, and the first thing that we're doing is, as, as I said at the outset, um, in line with our international commitments to the Rio Declaration on, on uh, Social Determinants, the agency, in collaboration with CAHI and StatsCan, has initiated the development of this reporting initiative. The objective of which is to provide a comprehensive overview of the state of health inequalities in Canada, a, a map, a picture, and then to serve as a baseline against which progress and trends um, can be measured. As uh, we're also building data infrastructure to enhance the availability of data on social determinants of health because we don't presume that all that data has already been captured. And as part of this work, we funded new data collection on self-reported experiences of discrimination as a one-time addition to the 2013 Canadian Community Health Survey. So that data has already been collected, and StatsCan is going to release that data set, or has released that data set to the Public Health Agency um, mid-March of this year. Um, and we've been doing some internal validation and intend to uh, push that out to the, the research data centers um, across the country uh, quite quickly, actually. Um, so hopefully that will be uh, available uh, in early summer of this year. Um, so we certainly hope that uh, people will use uh, those data and, and stay in touch with us about how you're using it because uh, um, that will be very useful for us in terms of uh, future opportunities like that. So for the rest of my time, uh, I'd like to talk on, uh, focus on the, our inequalities reporting work. Um, over the past 10 years, building consensus on pan-Canadian reporting um, has included a range of efforts. Uh, going back to 2005, a federal, provincial, territorial task group on health disparities uh, released its report on the role of the health sector in reducing health disparities. And that report acknowledged that addressing Disparities rests on a commitment to documenting the extent of the disparities, developing evidence-based policies, and evaluating the, uh, the interventions, as Stefana was, was mentioning. So this re report recommended regular monitoring and, and reporting on health disparities in Canada. And as you know, in 2008, the WHO Commission report came out, um, and uh, both the Commission and the Rio Declaration spoke to um, the importance of measuring inequalities, and the Commission report actually recommended a framework for um, national surveillance of health inequalities. Around this time, the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Pan-Canadian Public Health Network, which is governed by a council of federal, provincial, and territorial government officials from jurisdictions responsible for public health, came together and commissioned a background report on developing health disparities indicators in Canada, which was essentially mapping the, the uh, potential Canadian indicators against the WHO Commission framework. And then in 2010, the PHN, again drawing on that framework, uh, released the Indicators of Health Inequalities report, where it recommended that um, uh, the establishment of, of a pan-Canadian uh, reporting process. And it recommended, indeed, that FAC, StatsCan, and CAIHI partner 
um, to lead uh, on the reporting of these, these indicators, which brings us to where we are today. So what is the current state of reporting on health inequalities in Canada, uh, particularly the pan-Canadian state? Um, some of the recommended indicators from, from the PHN report um, are already published in various national reports by FAC or StatsCan or CHI-HI. Um, however, there is no pan-Canadian report dedicated to the status of health inequalities in Canada. Selected indicators are also included in provincial and territorial uh, departmental reports, um, and at least one example of, of these types of reports can be found in every province um, and territory, but neither the indicators that are used nor the disaggregators or stratifiers th uh, that are reported on are consistent across those reports, so we can't really con you know, uh, systematically compare those. And then, again, a number of local public health units also uh, produce reports on inequalities or determinants of health, um, but it, often enough these are sort of one-off reports, um, not necessarily regularly recurring. Some of them are, are um, relatively new, and so there may be some potential for future iterations. And it is, of course, important, as Stefana mentioned, to have that local level data. But in terms of pan-Canadian reporting, again, there's no consistent um, systematic approach to monitoring. So, um, there, our process so far in getting that, that reporting off the ground um, was for the three agencies to come together. FAC has been leading this effort, um, and we brought together in 2012 a national advisory committee to provide us with some advice, uh, strategic advice on the scope and the nature and the approach and the frequency of, of the reporting on health inequalities that we hope to do. So this uh, uh, committee um, has quite a broad membership, as you can see, from academia to um, federal, provincial, territorial governments, um, uh, academics, well, I already said academics, we have a lot of academics, we love academics. Um, <laughs> and the approach that they recommended was uh, that the baseline report, the Pan-Canadian baseline report, be one of a suite of products, one of a set of products um, that report on health inequalities. So this is not intended to, to be everything to everyone, but that it be one one of a, a number of products that can complement and serve as a foundation for other reporting initiatives uh, currently underway and potentially uh, to be undertaken by others. And one of those other reporting initiatives is in fact the Trends in Health Inequalities Report that is presently being um, developed by the Canadian Institute for Health Information. And it's focusing on income-related health inequalities only, so it's primarily that's its focus, across a, a range of indicators over time. So it's using, I think, almost 20 years of data. So it will be providing that trend data. Our baseline reporting will be a, a, a provide a sort of a benchmark from which we'll measure future work. And then, of course, we've developed a technical working group uh, to uh, provide us advice on, on more technical items, including data availability and access analysis, uh, reviewing uh, draft reporting, and again, quite a wide range of folks, including uh, some people here in the audience and our esteemed, uh, our esteemed uh, panel chair this morning uh, are involved in that process. So how are we operationalizing what uh, constitutes a, a, an indicator of health inequalities? We're defining those as indicators of health status and health determinants disaggregated by population groups, subpopulation groups. So uh, in our work, we are uh, defining and analyzing data for over 50 indicators of health status, everything from mortality to disease prevalence, um, as well as determinants of health, from health behaviors to structural conditions. So again, everything from um, healthy eating to working conditions to health care and so on. We'll be analyzing these data by 13 disaggregators, which include, as you can see, age, sex, income, education, employment, occupation status, Aboriginal status, cultural racial origin, immigrant status, rural urban residents, disability status, sexual orientation, and province and territory. So again, these disaggregators are based on the, the WHO surveillance framework, um, which recommended um, at least uh, uh, a number of these disaggregators, we've actually gotten all the way up to 13, which I think is quite, quite an accomplishment, um, but it does follow those recommendations from WHO. So here are some of the, uh, 
the indicators that we're using as they're grouped um, by the WHO. So these groupings reflect the WHO framework on, on uh, health equity um, surveillance. They're not necessarily the way we're going to report uh, in these categories, um, but this is just for consistency uh, with the framework. So you can see the indicators of health status include those uh, related to mortality, early childhood development, uh, mental illness, morbidity and disability, uh, self-assessed physical and mental health, and cause-specific outcomes, which are things like um, specific chronic conditions, cancer incidents, infectious diseases, um, childhood immuni immunization rates, oral health, and so on. The data sources that we're using um, to measure these indicators include everything from vital statistics to the Canadian Community Health Survey, uh, the Cancer Registry, um, and we're also uh, presently in negotiations with the data stewards for the First Nations um, Regional Health Survey so that we can have access to those data as well, um, and potentially uh, creating some indicators that are uh, specific to um, measuring resilience in First Nations communities so that, because we're quite mindful of that uh, across many of these sort of more standard indicators, First Nations are likely to come out rather poorly and we also want to acknowledge the importance of, of pointing to uh, areas of resilience. Um, thank you. So these are the, uh, the health determinants uh, indicators. They include both daily living conditions and, and structural drivers. Um, so they include uh, those related to health behaviors, physical and social environment, working conditions, health care, social protection, which is things like eligibility for EI or uh, empl em employment insurance, uh, and access to subsidized childcare, as well as social inequities, which include things like the level of homelessness, the working poor, food insecurity, and so on. Um, so in addition to the data sources I've already mentioned, uh, that we're using things like the Labour Force Survey and the Canadian Census. Um, and we're looking to do some further indicator development uh, in the domains of gender equity and uh, other socio-political context, uh, contextual factors. Um, so that work is, is ongoing. We're still sort of early in our work on this, so please take uh, these uh, what I'm saying is sort of preliminary results and also the, the items on this slide as preliminary. Um, this shows the four summary measures that we're proposing to assess and report for each indicator. Um, this actually is a, is a snapshot of, of uh, the uh, age standardized smoking prevalence among Canadian men. It's uh, our preliminary results. So you see a nice gradient there across income quintiles and uh, we're going to be uh, reporting on summary measures such both relative and absolute indices by the way which is uh, also recommended by the um, uh, the WHO framework uh, so we'll be reporting on the rate ratio which in this case sh shows the smoking rate for males in the lowest income quintile is about one and a half times higher than the rate for those in the highest income quintile uh, the rate difference as a percentage which shows that about 35% of the 29% smoking rate among males in the lowest income quintile could be avoided if they had the same uh, health profile as those in the highest income quintile. Um, the population attributable rate, which is an absolute, an absolute measure, showing the smoking rate among males in the population could be reduced by almost 2% um, if the males in the lowest income quintile had the same health profile as those in the highest income quintile. And then the population impact number, which refers to the number of cases that could be avoided, um, again, if the lowest income quintile men had the same health profile as the highest. So you can imagine with 56 indicators and 13 disaggregators, I think I made a comment yesterday about swimming in data. So we have a lot of results and we're, uh, we're struggling with ways to, to, uh, to figure out how to start to interpret these results, how to sort of sift through them. And so one of the things we're doing is producing matrices. And again, this is preliminary, but it gives you an example of what we'll be doing for each of our summary measures by sex. So we'll produce a, a matrix like this of all the indicators and disaggregators. The indicators are across the top and the disaggregators are down the side here. We have, this is actually truncated, we can't fit the whole matrix on one slide. Um, 
And the colors are assigned for uh, specific ranges of the summary measures uh, to indicate the extent of inequality compared to the reference group of, of the stratifier. So uh, red shows the greatest inequalities and green shows the lowest inequalities. Um, and it, the assumption we're making here is that the reference group for each disaggregator or each stratifier is the group with the most presumed social privilege or advantage. So of course, for gender, that's males. For income, that's the highest income quintile. For racial, cultural background, that's white. So this is, we're hoping that this is going to help us just do some preliminary sifting. Um, and, and we may be using some sort of model like this as a way of reporting some, some high level results as well as sort of a quick snapshot. Um, and that's very convenient because I am wrapping up. Uh, so our next steps, uh, we are, as I said, we're sort of uh, partway through this process, so I'm not here to report results for you, but uh, more about the process. So we'll be consulting with some key stakeholders and uh, potential users of the report to, think, to get their input on what's the best way to visually present this, um, what kinds of knowledge translation activities should we be thinking about uh, around these, uh, these data. Um, and from our initial analysis, um, again, which includes this, this matrix um, that I just showed, we want to try to, to identify 10 to 15 uh, areas of the most uh, profound inequalities um, to, to uh, highlight, I guess, in our, in our baseline reporting. Um, and our intention in this case is, is um, particularly to focus on where poor outcomes are, are observed in, in more disadvantaged populations. So we hope to have that uh, 10 to 15 indicators of the most profound inequalities sort of surfaced and reported on uh, by uh, sometime in 2015-16. Now, from my point of view, that's, that's uh, it's a nice cushion because that's the fiscal year. So it may be 2015, maybe a little bit into 2016. Uh, data tables on all 50 plus indicators will be made available online, actually in advance of our sort of final reporting, uh, so that others can, can access them. We're hoping to get the data tables online by uh, January of 2015. Uh, where they're online is, is uh, still under discussion in terms of the three partners and, and how we'll be able to manage that logistically. And then we're also working with various academic and other partners to develop intersectional or multivariate analyses of agency priority policy issues, so things like mental health, um, which we, and we've already undertaken some of that work with uh, Dr. Veenstra. Uh, again, sort of addressing what Stefana was remarking on, on, on the critical importance of doing some depth analysis to really see how these, these um, uh, social um, conditions and environmental conditions are interacting and uh, to produce these health inequalities. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, before I, I finish, um, and you applaud wildly, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank Sarah McDermott, who is uh, the, our lead uh, and senior analyst on this work. She's been doing an incredible amount of work uh, uh, on this project so far. So uh, all debt to Sarah and, uh, and our team. And uh, thank you very much and look forward to your questions.